True Remembrance is a short visual novel that I had no real expectations for. All I really knew going in was that it was generally well received by readers. And for most of my time reading, my general thoughts were, this isn't bad, not the best story I've ever read, but far from the worst. But then came one scene in particular that completely changed how I think of this visual novel, where questions were answered and all the themes of the story were brought together, completely recontextualizing everything. This one scene brought the story from I'd say a mid to low B tier to a solid A tier. So please, join me as I take a look at True Remembrance. But before I really get going, if you think I'm doing a good job, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. It genuinely does help me out. Twitter and Discord are linked below as well. And if you want to support the channel more directly, you can get early access via Patreon or you can use YouTube's Super Thanks feature below the video to leave a highlighted comment that I will read out in a future video. Alright, enough of that. In addition to being a pretty good visual novel, True Remembrance is actually available for free and there will be a link in the description. I would strongly suggest reading through it yourself before watching this video. Of course, you can do whatever you want, but this video contains spoilers that I feel will rob you of a lot of the mystery and intrigue you'd find on a first read. I'll give a brief overview of what the story is all about before going into spoiler territory, and of course I will have another warning at that point. But please do consider reading the visual novel before continuing past that point. So with that, let's get into it. The best way I can describe True Remembrance's setting is a supernatural dystopia. The world and its rules are very similar to our own with a few distinct differences. Firstly, the world is afflicted with an ailment known as the Dolor. This is essentially the leveled up version of depression. When someone goes through an emotional trauma and contracts the Dolor, it manifests itself as psyche corrosion. To the best of my understanding, the Dolor is the ailment itself while psyche corrosion can refer to both the cause of the Dolor and its actual symptoms. The end result of the Dolor is often a self-unaliving. Not long after the Dolor presented itself in this world, some individuals were shown to have the ability to suppress the memories of others. With education and hard work, those with this ability could go on to become mnemonicides, where they'd be employed by the government and tasked with caring for patients, colloquially referred to as guests who are afflicted with the Dolor. Their job is to isolate the memories that caused the psychic corrosion and suppress them, effectively curing them by retroactively removing the trauma that affected them in the first place. This is done in an isolated town populated entirely by mnemonicides and their guests. The general idea is that by bringing the guests somewhere they've never been for their treatment and then removing the memory of the treatment alongside their psyche corrosion, they can limit the possibility of something triggering the resurgence of memories that have been suppressed. Because as explained in the story, the only mnemonicides who can outright remove memories are the so-called Omega class, of which there are only a dozen or so in the world. The story itself features two protagonists with a shifting perspective. First, we have Black Iris, an emotionally repressed mnemonicide who is pretty bad at dealing with people and has a pretty cynical outlook on life all around. He is very good at his job, pretty much as good as you can be without being an Omega, which is another league of power entirely. The other protagonist is his guest, a young woman by the name of La. She has a very complex and deep-seated case of the Dolor, one which requires several months for Black Iris to both locate and work on the memories that form the foundation of her psyche corrosion. The story as a whole focuses primarily on these two, their interactions, and how each of them views the world and their own past experiences. True Remembrance asks a lot of questions, and until the answers are revealed, you'll be seeing little clues and trying to piece together different bits of information. What caused La's psyche corrosion? What is her story? Why is Black Iris such a blunt and callous person? Why is he friends with the cheerful cafe owner despite Black Iris being kind of a dick? That's the core of True Remembrance. It asks questions and slowly adds layers and details to explore these characters as their stories play out. And you know what? Not every question you have gets answered. Many will, but some won't. True Remembrance leaves some things up to the reader and up to speculation, and that's something I respect a lot in a story. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you'll know that one thing I complain about, even in stories that I really like, is when the writer doesn't trust the intelligence of the reader and feels the need to hold your hand through all the deeper meaning. True Remembrance does the exact opposite and it's a lovely breath of fresh air. Okay, that's about all I can say without spoilers. Again, I'd highly recommend reading the visual novel yourself before watching past this point. It's linked in the description. You have been warned. So let's take a slightly deeper look at these characters. Earlier in the video, I really didn't do Black Iris justice as a character because I really didn't want to spoil anything about his progression. While yes, he is a bit of a cynical asshole, that's not the totality of his personality. I would say that he's actually a very caring person, but also a very detached one. Though he doesn't express himself very well, he always does everything he can to care for La rather than just doing the bare minimum. When she's upset, he tries to comfort her despite kinda sucking at the whole human interaction thing. When she catches a cold, he insists on taking her to the hospital to get it checked out. On multiple occasions, he takes La out into the town because he knows it'll make her happy. 
If it were just him, he'd go out, do his business, and return with pretty much no deviation. But for her, he makes the extra effort. And furthermore, I think he actually has a bit of a playful streak when he's around people he's grown comfortable with. Once he and La develop a bond, he occasionally teases her because she's easily flustered. He has a very dry sense of humor that regularly creeps into his narration. When talking with the good-natured Rook, he just likes to fuck with them a bit, viewing the conversation almost as a competition where he wins if he gets the upper hand. Black Iris is not the person you'd expect at the very start. Yes, he does come off as kind of an asshole, but he's not a bad person, and you get the sense that there's something deeper going on. I think Law put it best. He does care. So much. I've lived with him every day. I know. He cares. More than anyone. La is a foil to Black Iris in that she's an openly caring person with a very cheerful personality and a childlike attitude towards the world around her. Where Black Iris is closed off and rude, La is open and personable. She also has a very motherly streak. As soon as she gets comfortable as Black Iris' guest, she pretty much insists on doing the cooking and helping with the general housework. She's also shown to be a voracious reader and is very curious to learn about the world around her. Her past is a near total mystery for most of the story, and all we really know until the final act is that she had at one point lost someone she called Pops. Probably the most interesting thing about her is that if we weren't told otherwise, we probably wouldn't have identified her as afflicted with the Dolor. She seems to be a generally happy person, and aside from the fact that she was crying when she first arrived, there's no surface level indication of any emotional issues whatsoever. And even the crying was pretty quickly revealed to be a physiological reaction, not one born out of any kind of sadness. So that's one of the big mysteries about her. Why is she here with Black Iris? Now, I think this interesting core premise is amplified by two additional guests that Black Iris takes on over the course of the story, because they highlight the difference between a more standard case of the Dolor and La's unique situation. But they also shed light on the nature of mnemonicide work and dispel the idea that memory suppression is necessarily a wonder pill for psychic corrosion. The first guest is a young boy by the name of Marcello. He's a rich kid with all the naivete that comes with it, though he is incredibly polite and respectful. He wants Black Iris to erase everything. All of his memories. This is because he suffers from an inferiority complex. His family are all wealthy and successful, and he's basically been set up for success in his life. However, he doesn't consider himself to be exceptional in any way and feels the weight of expectation. By virtue of being born into this successful family, it's expected that he too will go on to be highly successful and it gives him anxiety because he's just not sure he's capable of it. And it's made very clear that this is simply his own perception, not something impressed upon him by his family. In fact, he explicitly states that his family has been nothing but loving and supportive, though he still feels the anxiety stemming from his inferiority complex. Now, the way Black Iris handles the situation is interesting, and in my opinion, highlights the fact that he is far more concerned with the welfare of others than his demeanor would suggest. He gets Marcello to talk about his life and his family, and after some time, tells him that the process has already begun and cannot be reversed. Everything he has ever known will be forgotten, and his very identity will soon be erased so that he can develop anew. It is a death of sorts. And he does this in a way that emphasizes all the positive aspects of Marcello's life that will be taken from him. The person he was and the fond memories he does have. And this scares the shit out of him. He feels a visceral dread and regrets the decision almost immediately. Now, this actually reflects on a fascinating phenomenon that exists in the real world where those who attempt to unalive themselves very often regret the decision once they've passed the point of no return. As an example, let me tell you about the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California. Jumping off this bridge is a morbidly iconic way that many people have died, and sadly, around 98% of jumpers do die. However, of the estimated 34 who survived, 29 of them are on record as saying that they regretted the decision as soon as they began to fall. Marcello had that moment, and even though he quickly comes to terms with it and tries to be optimistic, he still ultimately regrets his decision. That's when Black Iris is all, I pulled a sneaky on ya, and reveals that he lied. He never started the mnemonicide process, and Marcello will retain his memories. He wanted Marcello to fully grasp the gravity of his decision and to get the full perspective. So when he offers Marcello the choice once again, he immediately decides to keep his memories and attempt to work through his issues rather than running away from them. So he opts to back out of the treatment, as is his right as a guest, and he leaves to go back to his life. So this was the first real instance of the Namanased protocol being described as anything other than a universally good thing. See, the Dolor is classified as a pandemic in this world, and the Namanased protocol is touted as the only real cure for the disease. If you don't get rid of the memories, you live with the psyche corrosion. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that the Dolor is an allegory for depression, or more specifically, depression stemming from an experience as opposed to a chemical imbalance. But memory suppression isn't necessarily a cure to all your problems. It's more that it pushes them to the side, hides them for a time. Marcello's problems did not come from some sort of trauma, but from deep-seated insecurity. 
It's arguable that he didn't even have the Dolor in the first place. Had Black Iris taken the easy route and simply wiped his memories, that wouldn't really help him. Instead, he gave him a new perspective and a new lease on life, and when he leaves the town, you get the feeling that things will be better for him, that he'll appreciate the loving family he has and the life he lives. For Marcello, it was better to not receive treatment. The next guess also reinforces this idea, but in a different way. This is a young woman by the name of Irina. The details of her situation are kept fairly vague, but the gist of it is that she's engaged to be married and wants Black Iris to wipe the memories of her family. Irina is a kind and gentle woman who quickly bonds with La. Like La, she doesn't appear to be all too troubled on the surface, but she's very resistant to sharing her problems. This section is honestly a bit hard to wrap my head around, and I may need to do a second read at some point to really comprehend it, but to the best of my understanding, there seems to be either some sort of conflict between her fiancé and her family, or she feels trapped between her emotional obligations to both. Again, it's not very clear and the details are few and far between. But in a conversation with La, Black Iris expresses that the source of her troubles is likely not that her family is abandoning her, but that she's using the Nemonicide protocol to emotionally run away from them. Now, unlike Marcello, Black Iris actually goes through with Irina's treatment. She leaves the town in a daze, having lost all memories of her family. And when she leaves, she'll lose the memories of her time in treatment, including the happy ones she made with her new friend La. And unlike Marcello's departure, this one is very bittersweet you don't get the sense that she's really been helped. Ultimately, all Black Iris was able to do was help her hide from her problems, though it's still unclear as far as to what those problems truly were. But her initial concerns have been waylaid. Whatever conflict she was having ultimately is resolved for the time being. But because her problems were implied to have been the result of her own internal workings rather than the result of an external trauma, she could very well have similar troubles in the future. It's never really made clear, but there's an overall air of sadness to her departure, only amplified by the fact that she and La must now say goodbye forever. But though Irina and Marcello may seem like opposite scenarios, there is one thing that connects them. Black Iris gave them the final say. At the end of the day, they had a choice. Run from their problems or face them head on. Irina chose to run and her future seems uncertain. Marcello chose to challenge his demons and his future seems difficult, but hopeful. See, I initially thought that the Dolor was simply an allegory for depression, a way of representing real-world psychological issues and mental illness in a more concrete manner within the story. And well, it is, but I think it's actually broader than that. The Dolor is ultimately a representation of all the inner demons that can reside in one's mind. Depression, trauma, and all the resulting fuckery is certainly a part of it, but so are the various insecurities and emotional weaknesses that I'd argue most seemingly normal people go through to some degree. And these issues are not so easily pushed away through the Nemonicide Protocol. See, in the case of extreme external trauma, the Nemonicide Protocol is honestly ideal. Since the source of that particular psyche corrosion is something that happens to you rather than within you, removing the memory of that event is an effective cure. But if the root cause is an internal problem, removing painful memories is only really treating symptoms. Not to say that can't be helpful, of course. If someone is suffering from extreme psyche corrosion and is about to unalive, symptom reduction is absolutely a good thing. But the mnemonicides cannot truly treat those internal issues, at least not with their powers. Interestingly, the only time we see Black Iris truly set anyone on the path to recovery is with Marcello, where he never used his powers at all. Marcello and Irina suffered from problems that only they can truly rectify, and while Black Iris can certainly nudge them in the right direction, it's ultimately up to them to make that difficult decision. Okay, so I'm getting a bit philosophical here, but I really do need to lay the groundwork for the messages that True Remembrance is trying to convey. I can't properly explain the impact of that one scene without it. I do need to give just a bit more background, but it won't be long. Basically just a few facts and plot points that are relevant. Firstly, one fact that is established relatively early on is that Black Iris had at one point been friendly with a man named Analy, often referred to as the Alpha of Omegas. I already explained that Omega-class mnemonicides are a league of power all their own, and are the only ones capable of completely removing memories. Even highly skilled mnemonicides like Black Iris, who is Alpha-class, can only suppress memories. Analy basically stands at the top of the Omegas. Nearly every textbook that prospective mnemonicides use in their study and training was either written by him or written under his supervision. He's basically THE mnemonicide. It's also generally accepted that the more powerful the mnemonicide, the more eccentric they tend to be. Black Iris's eccentricities are pretty obvious in his detached demeanor. Analy is also very strange, but in a very different way that's hard to explain. But he's much more personable than Black Iris. The next thing you'll need to know is that there is this B-plot about an anarchist group committing acts of terrorism, and there's an implied political struggle going on, but it's never really expanded on. 
We also at one point meet a man named Dexter, who is Black Iris' superior. Black Iris clearly doesn't like him much. This is all its own thing, but it mostly serves as a means of setting the story in motion and of forcing a more definitive conclusion than we'd have otherwise seen. So I'm not going to talk about it too much in this video, but you do need to at least know that it exists. Okay, so now let's talk about that scene. That one scene that I feel brings this visual novel from good to great. One last spoiler warning because I'm going to spoil basically everything that matters. It starts out simple. Black Iris is going out to do errands. La decides to stay home. Black Iris notes that this is out of character for her, but doesn't dwell on it. Now, at this point, you have to understand that the writing of this visual novel is very meticulous. The first two acts of the story essentially serve the sole purpose of building up the relationship between Black Iris and La, building tension, and presenting questions. So much of the early parts of the story, even minor details and throwaway lines, play into this moment, and it's one of the reasons I think I need to reread True Remembrance sooner rather than later. Obviously, I can't lay it all out in a video unless I just fucking read the visual novel out, but I have to try to explain that much to you. So you're feeling a bit uneasy, but not alarmed at this point, both because of how this is strange for Law and some of the other tension building things that happened previously. And then, while Black Iris is out, his mind starts to slip a little. He has trouble collecting his thoughts and remembering certain things. This goes against everything we had ever seen from his perspective. Black Iris is a methodical and meticulous person. He is incredibly intelligent, follows his routines to a T, and has an incredible attention to detail. For him to suddenly experience severe brain fog is jarring. It is abundantly clear from the outset that something is not right. I really cannot praise the translation team enough. This is one of the few translated works I've read that is able to actually utilize prose as a narrative tool. Prose is an incredibly difficult thing to bring from one language to another, and of course I don't know Japanese, but the translators were able to effectively use a tonal shift to convey the factual message that something is strange, as well as the emotional message of, oh fuck, something's wrong. So you the reader probably figured it out about the same time Black Iris does. It's La. La is a mnemonicide. La was never his guest, he was hers. La is erasing his memories and we don't know why. So he rushes back home and bursts through the door right as it becomes too much for him. He's completely overwhelmed by La's powers and collapses. And the last thing he experiences before everything goes black is La cradling him in her arms, telling him it'll all be okay. That moment is such a whirlwind of emotions where half a dozen questions get answered while like 50 more get asked. We now know the what, but the why is even more out of sight than ever. And for the first time, we're concerned for Black Iris personally. Up to this point, he's never been shown to be vulnerable. At all. Shit, nearly every interaction he's been in, he's been the dominant force. The only time he's been in any kind of distress is out of concern for La, such as when she got sick or when the anarchist group kidnapped her at one point. But now, he's weak. He's vulnerable. While we know that La is not acting maliciously, she's still using her mnemonicide powers on him against his will, effectively robbing him of his memories. But why? Well, turns out this wasn't the first time Black Iris had his memories fucked with. And those moments he previously lost came back in a flashback, and now we finally get some answers. We're traveling back. The exact length of time isn't super clear, but through context clues we can guess that it's a few years. Black Iris runs into a young girl who doesn't say so much as a single word, but she's carrying a slip of paper with Black Iris' address, indicating that she'd been sent there. Now here's the thing. This isn't stated in the narration for quite some time, but just by looking at this girl, you can tell that it's La. And it's a striking revelation to know that these two had met before the start of the story. And another interesting factor is that the La of the present has white hair, while the La in the flashback has black hair. So for the time being, you're left curious about that fact. So Black Iris reasons that the only person weird enough to send a person his way without notice was the ever-eccentric Alpha of Omega's Adelai. So he just decides to roll with it and make sure that the then unnamed La is comfortable, though she just kind of stands there like a zombie. Eventually, Analai shows up, makes Black Iris cook him dinner, and explains that he's using her for something secretive, doesn't really care much for her, but is content with Black Iris's good treatment of her. So from time to time, La would visit with Black Iris, who would care for her without doting on her. Essentially, he just treated her like a fucking person, and allowed her to read his books, eventually buying some of her own once she had made her way through his collection. And slowly, she started to warm to him and started to open up, speaking a few words here and there and developing an actual personality. It's not quite as engaging as the bond we saw develop at the start of the story, but it's pretty nice and the intrigue of the entire situation kept me hooked. And we also learn a bit about Black Iris's past. We'd seen snippets earlier, but now we're getting the full picture. He had escaped from some sort of oppressive society where he'd basically have been worked to death for starvation pay. He escaped with a friend of his. It's loosely hinted that she might have been a love interest, though it's left unclear. 
But when he was taken away for nemonicide training, she felt abandoned and developed a severe case of the dolor, ultimately requiring nemonicide treatment herself which removed all memories of Black Iris. So by the time he had graduated, she had been completely lost to him. But the song that she liked to sing resonated with La, and in fact, that was the source of her name. Since neither she nor Black Iris knew the lyrics, he told her to just use La's as it's a good way to sing a wordless song. It's a tragic story, but one he's seemingly made peace with. This goes on for some time, but eventually we learn the real truth about La, Analai, and the Omegas. So as explained by Analai, the Omega-class nemonicides are actually all non-sentient. They have no real humanity, personality, and they don't even really react to any stimuli. They're basically husks made out of flesh. But they are capable of erasing memories due to their extreme power levels. Or, well, more accurately, they don't erase memories. They absorb them. Once a guest's memories had been successfully suppressed by a more normal mnemonicide, they'd be taken to a secret facility where an Omega, all of whom are children, would take those memories into itself. So they aren't erased, but are in essence gone. And because the Omegas follow a different rule set, they don't suffer the same negative effects of psychic corrosion. So they can continue going all Dementor until the concentrated levels of psychic corrosion physically overwhelm them. Analai was one of these children until one day he inexplicably gained self-awareness. He was the first to do so, and upon his awakening, he was allowed to live a real life. Though as the first and only sentient Omega, he naturally gravitated towards mnemonicide study, where his research did wonders for the mnemonicide protocol. But there was a downside to his awakening. Now that he had self-awareness, the memories he had absorbed, the psyche corrosion he had taken upon himself, actually affected him, and he was miserable. Eventually, it threatened to completely overwhelm him, so he resolved to make his pain end. That's where La came in. She is another Omega who Analai had somehow obtained and kept in secrecy. His plan was to train her until she could eventually take on his psychic corrosion and free him from his suffering. Now this is a very interesting piece of the story for me. See, Analai is a very morally grey character and after finishing the story, I'm still not really sure what to make of him. On the one hand, he's generally a pleasant person and he seems like the kind of guy you'd be happy to have a chat with on the street. But he's also very pragmatic, and his relationship with Black Iris seems very transactional. Like, he only associates with him because he knows he can use him when necessary. And when it comes to La, he planned to do a profoundly selfish and, quite frankly, evil thing to her. He was going to offload his burdens onto her, to make her suffer in his place. Even as La began her own awakening and a bastardized Stockholm syndrome type of parent-child love formed between them, he still kept to his plan. It's weird. He never strikes me as an overtly bad guy, and he never seems malicious, but his plans were quite frankly indefensible in my eyes. But then, he makes a decision. As I said earlier, he'd resolved to make his pain end, but that end could come from La, or it could come from his death. And he tries to pass that choice off on Black Iris, giving him a gun and saying he could shoot him and save La, or let him do his thing. But ultimately, he did grow to care for La, even though he was so emotionally stunted that I don't think he ever truly processed it. In the end, he opts to die, and La finds him in his final moments, and she takes his psyche corrosion from him, which turns her hair pure white. As she herself states, she wanted him to be at peace when he died. This is when Black Iris found her, visibly upset from losing Analai and from the extreme psyche corrosion that she had willingly taken on. So he does the one thing he can think of. He moves to suppress her psyche corrosion, to ease her pain. But she snaps and screams at him, Get away from me! The psychic corrosion she had taken from him, as painful as it was, was the only thing she had left of him and she wasn't willing to give it up. So Black Iris walks away. So now, we're back in the present day. Black Iris wakes up and his memories are fully intact and he has a heart to heart with La. And to make a long story short, La explains what's been going on. On the day that Analai died, she took his psychic corrosion so that he could be happy for once in his life, even if only for a moment. She understands that Black Iris only wanted to help her, but as I stated earlier, she didn't want to let Analai, Pops, go. Even though her new memories were immensely painful, she still wished to instead power through, and in her emotional state she lashed out at Black Iris shouting, Get away from me. She always felt bad about that moment, how she pushed away and hurt someone who she cared about and who cared about her. In her mind, she acted cruelly. So at the behest of Dexter, and this ties into the B-plot that I didn't talk about, she decides that the best course of action is to wipe Black Iris' memories. To make him forget her so that her harsh rejection of his compassion wouldn't hurt him anymore. But Black Iris, in a nice way, basically tells her that she's being a fucking idiot. At the time, he was hurt. Partially by her demeanor, but also because he could no longer help her in the only way he really knew how. But before long, he got over it. He understood her decision and respected the hell out of her for being strong enough to face her psyche corrosion head-on, to preserve what's important to her even though it's painful. 
And the reason she's being a fucking idiot is because she didn't even consider that Black Iris might want to make the same exact choice for her. He cares for her, and even though their meeting at the start of the story wasn't the first, he'd still developed that same love and trust as back then. He wouldn't give up his memories of Law for anything, much less due to the first and as far as I know, only fight they've ever had. So they reconcile. Law realizes that she's being a fucking idiot, and they both agree to face their demons together. And to that end, they leave the Nemonicide town to begin a new life, spurred on by that B-plot that basically made it so they can't stay. One thing I really like about this ending is how it ties back into those themes and ideas that were introduced and reinforced throughout the story. Think back to Marcello and Irina and the conclusions I drew from their stories. Ultimately, their inclusion allowed True Remembrance to explore the concept of doing things the hard way to preserve what's important to you, versus taking the so-called easy way out and running from your problems. And it also explored the fact that at the end of the day, only you can make that choice. Marcello suffered from an inferiority complex. He didn't feel good enough next to his family. But with a little prodding from Black Iris, he decided to value the blessings he had, and things were looking up. Irina chose to run. Whatever was haunting her was too much to handle, and she left town in a bleak, bittersweet scene, having lost the memories of her family. They made their choices, and it's reflected in Black Iris and La. At the end of the day, both chose the hard way, the uphill battle where victory means keeping what matters most. But they don't have to go it alone. They have the support of each other, and despite their troubles, the future looks bright. I mean, Law has to deal with some of the most extreme psychic corrosion out there, an amalgamation of trauma that Analai had originally absorbed from who knows how many people. And Black Iris likely had a touch of the Dolor himself, given that he lost the person who mattered most to him at the time when she forgot him. But despite their struggles and the fact that they no longer have a means of supporting themselves, you get the sense that everything's gonna be alright. And that, my friends, is how you end a fucking visual novel. Now, if you've watched my other visual novel stuff, you'll know that I like slice of life, characters, and all that good stuff. So when I first started reading, I was more than happy to just enjoy the growing bond between Black Iris and La. I was enjoying the comedic scenes with Rook and interesting moments with Marcello and Irina. But that one extended scene, Black Iris getting slapped with the Mnemonicide Protocol followed by that flashback. That scene right there pulled everything the story did together and made me rethink the whole thing. Even little details, like how Black Iris mentioned that he cared for a kitten, is given a new light. After all, Analy referred to La as a little kitten. This was such a mindfuck of a visual novel, but not in an I'm confused now kind of way, but in an everything had a purpose, all of it kind of way. This is one of those stories where I know for a fact that there are parts that flew right over my head and I'm going to need a second read with a new perspective. That one scene turned this story from a good story that I'd give a solid recommendation for to one that I am very, very happy I read. If for some reason you ignored my earlier warnings, I'd still recommend this visual novel. I'm not gonna lie, you definitely damaged your first read, but I think it's worthwhile nonetheless. If you have read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. There are so many facets to this story, and I've only covered the tiniest fraction of them. Hell, I just recently had a pretty in-depth conversation on Discord that stemmed from a single offhand comment in Black Iris' narration. It's such a densely packed story, and it just blows my mind. While it's not my favorite story ever, I have to acknowledge the meticulous care that went into it, both in the original writing and in the localization that's still honestly some of the best use of prose I've seen in a translated work. True remembrance is genuinely something that should be studied in writing courses. Thanks for watching. Big thank you to my patrons, especially my god tier supporters, Bulk Squat Thrust, Drago, Fatima, and Michael Rotolo. If you'd like to join them and get early access to future content, consider checking out Patreon down below. Alternatively, I just unlocked the Super Thanks feature on my channel, which will allow you to leave a tip and a highlighted comment. Any Super Thanks contributions I receive will be read out at the end of a future video, and if it contains a question, I'll answer it. If you liked the video, don't forget to like and subscribe because it actually does help me in the almighty algorithm. Follow me on Twitter at AdsTweets for various fun things, and join the Discord server linked below for some good times. I know it's been a while since my last upload, but I definitely needed that break. I'm back now and better than ever. So with all that said, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Play the Electro Swing.